So you think you're an 80s fan? Okay, Sister Christian, can you handle this? <laughs> Autobots, transform! And move in! It's I Love the 80s, and this is 1984. The flicks, the fashions, the trends, the tunes, the TV. Jackson was rushed to the hospital. Well, I did it. <laughs> A totally awesome year that gave us these burning questions. It's the heart of rock and roll in Huey's pants. I'm average. How did those footloose kids learn to dance so fast? Unbelievable. And wait a minute, you mean that wham guy's not straight? Surely you jest. Plus, detectives without socks. You got it, man. <laughs> and the old lady who loved meat. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Because you love the 80s, because you still sleep with your Care Bears. Admit it, this is 1984. <laughs> Breaking happened truly in the mid-70s, but it wasn't until MTV that everyone got to see it. Breakdancing became one of those phenomenons that everyone knew about. But all of a sudden, people were doing it at bar mitzvahs and sweet 16s. This is 1984. I was going to one sweet 16 after another. And the first one I ever went to, a buddy of mine tried to break dance and split his pants. And ever since then, I'm like, there's no way I am too white to do that. I was heavily into breakdancing, and I used to have my spike belt buckles, you know what I'm saying? I used to have my handkerchief. We would put a cardboard box down, a big radio, and we'd do these moves for change. I didn't do it. It's just some things that the fat Jewish kid with braces doesn't do. And breakdancing is right on top of the list. Was I not breakdancing at any point in 1984? It's the question. I could spin on my back, I could do, I mean, I could show you right here. I can still do it. Say go white boy, go white boy, go! I learned how to do the, uh, what's it called, the caterpillar? Well, you would lay down on the ground and do that thing. What was it called? The worm, the worm, the worm. It was called the worm. Yeah, the worm. I, I could worm it backwards and forwards. I could do standing flips. I could do back handsprings. I could pop. Popping is just that sort of kind of undulation that you do with your body. Yeah, that's popping. A jam on me. Remember they used to do the thing called battling? Oh, my cousin would dance in the mirror for hours and be like, I gotta go battle this dude at school tomorrow. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. What a wonderful alternative to fight. Because the gangs in New York were apparently having dance contests instead of stabbing each other. Suddenly, Harlem had become like West Side Story. Ah! You people hate the party and you want to do it right. Well, I was in the first movie breaking. And the breaking movies were very, like, happy, pastel outlines of what the hip-hop culture was about. Was Gabe Kaplan in that movie? I don't know. Who, was, who else was in breaking? Popping Taco and Popping Pete. Turbo and Ozone is Shabadoo and Boogaloo Shrimp. The performances in Breakin' were incomparable. What are you worried about? You're the best, right? I remember crying, it was very moving. Even now, breakdancing holds a certain respect in the community, you know? You just respect breakdancing no matter how old it got. Not a got a cut loose, foot loose. Pick up your Sunday shoes. And something about Louise. Okay, here's a town where no one's allowed to dance. And then who moves in? The young kid who loves to dance. Problems galore. Your log is loud music. Let's watch that attitude, boy. This guy is so pissed about his situation that all he can do is just get out there and dance. My favorite thing is the stunt dancer that they bring in for Kevin Bacon during the big Never, 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 never gonna hide your heart I thought Kevin Bacon really actually did that dance scene and I found out later that he didn't but it was actually one of the best dance scenes that I can ever remember That scene where Chris Penn learns to dance that's one of the greatest scenes in cinema Let's hear it for the boy I did the little dance, remember they were trying to do that little walk? And I said, those are the goofiest looking white cats with no rhythm that I've ever seen. 
That's my favorite scene because it's so hopeful, it's so inspiring. If Kevin Bacon could teach Chris Penn to dance, then I don't know, we might live in a world without war. Sarah Jessica Parker still has her square pegs hair. Cute. Lori Singer, poor man's Daryl Hannah at the time, I guess. John Lithgow, really doing a fantastic job in that. These one. days of this obscene rock and roll music turned them into one big fiery cinder like and finally, you know, he relinquished control, then it's just a massive release. It's wonderful. Let's dance! How'd they learn to dance so fast at the end of that movie? They've never been allowed to dance, but all of a sudden they can do all the latest 80s breakdance moves. Unbelievable. I think the moves lived in them. They were in their blood. It's very much like when you saw the Iron Curtain come down later in the 80s and you saw the celebrations in Prague and in Budapest and in Moscow and in Berlin. It was the same way that these kids liberated were just able to dance. I love 84. We are a couple of weeks into the new year. What do you hope will happen not only in 1984 but for the rest of your professional life? Mm, to rule the world. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be Madonna. Every girl wanted to be Madonna. And some of the guys, I'm not going to lie to you, some of the guys. The whole boy toy thing, that's what really took off. I didn't know what it meant, but it sounded like a good thing. I wanted to be one. I was 12, so it was sending me all kinds of messages that I don't want to talk about right now. She was just sassy and she didn't care. She wore her underwear outside her clothes like someone who'd been struck by lightning. You must be my lucky star. My reaction was always, this Madonna thing will be over in 10 minutes. There is nobody I could have hated more, and her fans I could not have hated more. Yeah, when you wear Madonna clothes, everybody looks at you, right? Everybody just, everybody yeah, stares yeah, and says, look at that girl over there. The whole Madonna look, it was, it was, it was everywhere. The headbands with the big dangly hoops and all the bangles. Lace gloves with the fingers cut off. Oh yeah, no, 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 I did all that. There's no doubt about it. Like a virgin. <laughs> no comment from the peanut gallery. To think that this girl would put on a wedding dress and get on the stage of Radio City Music Hall at the MTV Awards and writhe around and sing a song called Like a Virgin, like the balls that it took for her to do that is undeniable. God, I'd like to do that. I wish I had the balls to do that. I would do it in a second. I don't think I fully understood the sexuality of it. I just knew that Madonna gave me a boner. <laughs> Corey Hart. Sunglasses, sunglasses at night. That was a kooky video. Corey Hart's pouty, intense expressions. It's like something really bothering him at the exact moment that they shot that video. Don't mess around with the man in shades. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> I think it's reckless behavior because wearing sunglasses at night is only going to cause us to bump into things and fall down. I love 84. It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? <laughs> Yeah, the first commercial, I think, catch line that I really remember being huge. I remember seeing a little patty like in the big middle of the gigantic bun. And it was m mostly just bun and a little bit of beef. The smartest thing was to get this little old lady who no one had ever heard of <laughs> and have her ask the famous question. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Clara Peller. May she rest in peace. Three words, boom. And she's a national phenomenon. Will you say, where's the beef for me one time? Did I what? Will you, <laughs> will you say, where's the beef for me one time? I sure will. Please. Where's the beef? I always felt bad for the other two old ladies. I felt like they were sort of the supremes, you know, the two that didn't move on. Whereas Clara Peller was clearly the Diana Ross of that trio. Hello? Where's the beef? It's the ultimate penis joke.
Yeah, it was an old lady saying something that was quasi-sexual and screaming it like she really wanted some beef. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? When Walter Mondale uses where's the beef, then it's over. You knew things were bad with the Democratic presidential nominee when he was using a Wendy's commercial slogan for his campaign. Where's the beef? That's the most memorable line of this campaign so far. This gives you an idea as to what what can take hold in this country. Maybe something I said, I wonder. I love Coming up, Michael Jackson on fire. Anytime your head explodes, I mean, it's, it's a, that's a tricky situation. It's all yours. The Great Orphan Craze. I know we'll make it a white orphan this time. Hey, and thumbs up on the album, thumbs down on the dance. Remember him dancing and thinking, stop it. Next on I Love 1984. But first, the makeout songs of 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, I, Lionel Richie, give you the makeout songs of 1984. Almost Paradise by Mike Reno and Ann Wilson. So take a look at me now. Against All Odds by Phil Collins. I ain't missing you at all. Missing you. And Missing You by John Waite. The makeout songs of 1984. Do you feel the love? I think you do. Makeout songs of 84. I love you. Babes of 84. I'm Brett Michaels, and I bring you the Babes of 1984. Paulina Porskova, hard to pronounce, babe. Daryl Hannah, amphibious, babe. babe. Tina Turner, the comeback, babe. babe. Heather Thomas, fall guy, babe. babe. And of course, Geraldine Ferraro, running mate, babe. babe. There you have it, the Babes of 1984, and I ought to know. Babes of 84. I love it. Born in the USA, one of the great records ever made. I had a copy of Born in the USA, like, uh, from the minute it was out, or maybe even before it was out. I had to rush out and buy it and sing every lyric, and, you know, I think everybody became a Bruce fan after that one, for sure. Bruce is just the man. He rocks the jeans, straight out of Jersey. He represented the hardworking people of America. You understand? He was like massive. That album was massive. I remember the Dancing in the Dark video. It was a hit for Springsteen. That was Courtney Cox being called up on stage, and she did that funny dance. <laughs> I remember him dancing and thinking, "Stop it." I just thought it was kind of the template of how two white people dance. <laughs> the butt shot, it was just so memorable. He's got this cute little button. He wears his little jeans and a little tight t-shirts. I remember that Ronald Reagan adopted Born in the USA as his campaign song without Bruce Springsteen's knowledge. I thought it was profoundly stupid to adopt an anti-war song that they misunderstood and exploited for their own purposes. In true rock and roll, you fashion, he says, don't you use my song, I don't care if you're the president, and that totally rocked. The Olympics have made tiny gymnast Mary Lou Retton America's new athletic sweetheart. Mary Lou Retton was this no-nonsense, no-frills girl from rural America, from West Virginia, who beat the communists. I was born in a small town. Yeah, 84 was a pretty good year for me. <laughs> I have to admit, that was a pretty good summer. Well, I did it. <laughs> that's, that's what I've been working hard for, and it's been my long-time dream. So I thought she was so cute, and her little bob haircut, her big smile, she was great. She was pretty cheerful. Yeah. Well, it's all part of the uh, gymnastics training, is to get that grin. There's actually, those muscles are exercised. They would take barbells in their mouth, like this. <laughs> This small town girl was only seven years old when she was inspired to be a gymnast. Now at 16, Mary Lou's an international celebrity. 
I won the Olympics on a Friday night, and then Saturday, you know, I remember all the headlines and all the papers with a star is born overnight. Watch out, big boy. She was everywhere, wasn't she? A little annoying. A little annoying, let's be honest. She was on that line. She had a toe over to annoying, but she really stayed on the endearing side. Everyone was captivated by Mary Lou Retton. Anytime a gymnast wins the gold medal, we are required as Americans to be captivated. America loved short people. Cute little short people like Mary Lou Retton, Gary Coleman, and Webster. I'm a thief. It's all yours. <laughs> Child. I had a crush on Webster. I sure did. And I wanted him to be my boyfriend. <laughs> Webster was just so precocious and just idealized for us the perennial child. Can you keep me? I just remember that every time I watch Webster, I would be reminded of how everybody was saying he was much older. He's like my age. He's like 40 or something, isn't he? Okay. Wasn't Webster getting Social Security by the time he was wrapping that show up? I mean, it all seemed a little bit weird. Why don't you come to us for some help? I did, but you looked pretty busy when I went into your bedroom. <laughs> Webster, of course, is a poor man, some different strokes. These shows where little black kids wound up in the homes of rich white people. Didn't Gary Coleman fish that leg dry? And didn't he do it better? I sure hope he likes me. Orphans were hot in 1984. Yeah, more orphans. <laughs> Get us another orphan. I know we'll make it a white orphan this time. Where's your family, Punky? I don't know. You don't know? Punky Brewster was about a little girl who is abandoned by her father and left by her mother in a shopping mall and adopted by an older man. Punky Brewster had the guy from Police Academy looking after her. Grand cereal. Milk. And stewed prunes. <laughs> Real. It's a generational thing. He's old school, she's new school. She's trying to teach him how to be hip. I think that she was one of the, like, the original members of the hip hop community. She had the bandanas and the baggy pants and she had like the different colored converse. It was like punky and public enemy. <laughs> Don't believe the hype! Soleil Moon Fry, how'd you get the mm. name? I knew you were gonna. Yeah, you knew I was gonna do that. It's from Annie, get your gun, you got the sun in the morning and the moon at night. I had a crush on Punky Brewster, because at the time she would have been about four years younger than me, which is reasonable. Once I became a senior, she would have been a freshman. It could have worked out, I'm just saying. Soleil Moon Fry. Coming up, who said emotionless cyborgs can't be sexy? Terminator's a cool robot cop with a cute ass. <laughs> the Gospel According to 16 Cats. No more Yankee, my Winky. And the long arm of the law rolls up its sleeves. It was all about the scrunching, gentlemen, the scrunching. Next on I Love 1984. Long on. But first, log on to VH1.com for everything 80s. Artist info, photo gallery, CD purchases, and great 80s trivia games. I love the 80s. Hi, I'm Tracy Elizabeth Lortz, and I bring you the hunks of 1984. Well, this one did. Ralph Macchio, Daniel Sunhunk. Nasty, nasty boys. Matt Dillon, tough guy teen hunk. C. Thomas Al, pretty boy teen hunk. Duran Duran, makeup and loose hunks. And Tom Hulls, 18th century Viennese composer hunk. There they are, the men of 1984, 100% USDA prime hunk. Hunks of 84. I love the I like Hugh Lewis. I still like Hugh Lewis. <laughs> you know, that was rock and roll. I love it. D.C., San Antonio, and the Liberty Town. Boston and all Santa Cruz. When you see their videos, it looked like they were actually having a great time. And you kind of root for a guy who looks like he's having fun. Rock and roll. love those videos. Everybody fell in love with him. He was so cute. I have heard the rumor that the news was 
in his pants, not behind him. It was that groupie Connie Hansen who wrote the book about all her escapades with rock stars. According to her, Huey Lewis had like a huge I'm average. I mean, if you lined up any 10 guys, I'd be an average looking guy. Rumors are a wonderful thing, aren't they? Huey peeing off the Golden Gate Bridge. Hey, this water's cold. And deep, too. I would be surprised if he had the biggest package, because then why does he want a new drug? He wants a new drug, he wants something, I imagine, a precursor to Viagra, because it's not big enough. I remember an interview where Huey Lewis said he wrote, I want a new drug in five minutes. And I remember thinking, that sounds about right. In 1984, that was the year that Hugh Lewis sued Ray Parker Jr. for stealing I Want a New Drug to make the song Ghostbusters. He should have. I mean, when I first time I heard Ghostbusters, I said, oh my God, that's I Want a New Drug. If you listen to them back to back, I mean, they're, they're very, very similar. There's something strange in the neighborhood. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. I Want a New Drug. I Want a New Drug. Ghostbusters. Is it sick? Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. When it won't make me sick, when it won't make me talk to Ghostbusters. They don't sound similar to me at all. Do you ever give any thought to how long this ride's gonna last? Only recently. I, uh, you know, it's been so fast. I think Huey Lewis and the news were as surprised that they had a big year as the rest of us were. Because he's just a he's just a working class guy singing about sports. Thank you. Free Miami Vice. Miami Vice, boy, what a great show. What a great new fresh show that was. I mean, you got a winning combination there. Don Johnson. Listen, Toots. Philip Michael Thomas. I'm all the years. And an alligator. Hey, hey, hey. Wait a minute. That's my alligator. A plus B equals far more than C in that equation. All units, move in. Code red, move in. It's a cop show for the 80s. I mean, we use a lot of uh, MTV images and rock music to help describe the mood and feeling of our show. My dad was a Chicago homicide cop and a detective, and I saw very little of my father in Don Johnson or the other guy. Maybe if my dad was a Chicago homicide cop. Maybe if my dad had been Miami homicide detective, he would have worn ice cream colored suits. And I don't know which one invented it, but one of them invented a suit with a t-shirt under it, okay? So the Miami Vice look is a white jacket, colors in the shirt, sleeves pushed up. It was all about the scrunching, gentlemen, the scrunching. And then the shoes with no socks. Oh yeah. The Where style. are your socks? Uh, I don't own a pair anymore. <laughs> The look of Miami Vice just kind of washed over the country. Don Johnson did it, so, so the bandwagon ensued. I was 13 years old, strutting around in my, you know, white linen jacket, my turquoise t-shirt. I looked gay. I looked about as gay as gay gets. You remember Don Johnson and Philip Michael Thomas both had records out? And who knew then that they would become the musical superstars that they are today? They should have stuck to their day jobs, yeah. No singing, just, just do what you're making the big bucks for. <laughs> I have a friend who is a psychotic Miami Vice fan to this day. You know, he's got pictures of tubs and Crockett all over his thing. I don't think any of us were ready for the kind of phenomena that it's become. Yeah, hey, yeah, this is good, isn't it? By golly, I think we're on to something. I love 84. How could that man just get up after you did? not a man. Machine. Terminator. That movie is clearly a classic. You know, we've all grown up knowing the Terminator. Terminator's a cool robot cop with a cute ass. <laughs> it was Arnold, and he kicked butt. That flick was a technological achievement at that time. When you look at it again, it just looks so honky-tonk. I used to do this thing. I would get out of the shower, and then I would yell for my mom and my sister to come in. I'd stand up doing the, the Terminator as he was, you know, as he first showed up, you know. It was weird. Don't put that in. I'm a friend of Sierra Connor. 
I was told that she's here. Could I see her, please? No. But I'd never seen any human seem so inhuman. Yeah, so I'm an Austrian and I will f*** you up. I think if you're looking for an emotionless cyborg, you're not going to do much better in terms of casting than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Still his best role. Well, that and twins, obviously. I'll be back. Can you imagine seeing Sliced Alone even play in Terminator? I'll be back. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, come on, man. It's got to be, I'll be back. That great accent, you know? I mean, come on, who else can say, I'll be back? I'll be back, he said. I'll be back. I heard that O.J. Simpson was going to be cast as the Terminator, but they thought he was too nice. Huh. A lot of movies don't hold up like the Terminator because it, it's a great story. It's a lot of fun. And Arnold Schwarzenegger could really kick ass back then. Can't do that. Wrong. I did. Transformers. Transformers. Robots in disguise. Transformers. Uh, more than meets the eye. He's a tank, a plane, a cruiser, a gun. Autobots transform. And move in. This is pure genius. If I could think of something that turned into something, I'd be a millionaire. Like if I could have the Emmanuel Lewis Transformer, it transforms into Gary Coleman. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. I'd be laying back on the beach in Tahiti counting my money. It's too bad this thing's not called transsexual or transgender, and it could be really interesting because you could pop in and out different modules. Yep, yep, yeah! I remember Care Bears and just feeling like they were weak. Braveheart likes us anymore. When you contrast the Transformer with the Care Bear, honestly, even as a woman, which are you going to go for? Transformer. Oh, the Care Bears stunk. That chick's name Heather would want you to sign these at in stores. There's a guy who sits here and s starts opining about Care Bears. <laughs> Kick his ass out of this chair. Oh, goody, goody, gosh. A happy, smiling face so you can forget about the total gross imbalance of money in America and how the poor and middle class became disenfranchised in the blink of an eye. You can hug your Care Bear as you get kicked out of your house. Oh! I'm a city fool. Wham was whammy, you know, wham was fun. It was very cute at the time. That was the kind of music I was into at the time. Wham! <laughs> Wham, George Michael, and somebody else. Who was he? I don't remember who the other guy was. It was George Michael and... Michael Wellmsley, whatever his name, what was his name? And the less important guy and the less attractive guy and the guy who didn't do much of anything. I thought it was a winning combination. George Michael and Andrew Ridgely. Boyhood friends, musical partners, life partners, question mark? We don't know. But God, did they make beautiful music together. <laughs> George Michael, I don't think me or my friends really had any sense of him being gay. We had a sense of him being British. I thought he was very happy. No, nobody knew George Michael was gay. Nobody even suspected. How could they? What would lead you to the conclusion that George Michael was gay? George Michael? Not the front man for Wham. Surely you jest. Wake me up before you go, go. I remember a lot of hopping around in the video, Wake Me Up Before You Go Go. I feel like they're jack in the boxes just sort of springing up everywhere. Nobody pranced and skipped better in 1984 than Wham. And I was prancing and skipping right there with him. Coming up, the parody that had metal dudes squirming in their spandex. It bothered me because it hit too so close to home. Lionel so busted. Did I think the bust looked like me? Absolutely not. Next on I Love 1984. But first, this public service announcement. Hi, we're the cast of Fame. We're here to ask you to take a second look at marijuana. New studies show that pot damages your lungs a lot more than you think. Especially if you're still growing. So anyone who tells you pot's harmless is wasting their breath. Whether it's school, sports, or working out. You can't fly if you're high! Hello! Weird 
Al Yankovic here. Let's take a look at how the world has changed since 1984. Recreational family vehicles. Then, the Chrysler Caravan, base priced at $8,669. Now, the Ford Explorer, base priced at $24,620. Super Bowl tickets. Then, 60 bucks. Now, 325 bucks. The Mac. Then, this wonderful machine had about 131,000 bytes of memory. Now, the latest version has over 500 million bytes of memory. To which the old Mac can only say one thing. Bite me. Then and now, 84. I love the We are live in Hollywood at the premiere of Purple Rain. The party is happening and you are invited. I saw Purple Rain the day before I left for college in 1984. And it blew my mind. Why are you a Prince fan? Because Prince is bad. I saw Purple Rain and then had sort of an obligatory erotic dream about Prince, like everybody did that year. Prince is the man. Was the man, is the man, was the man. Please welcome his royal badness, Prince. He had a purple limo and he smelled like lavender. He used to wear women's Armani. And he was just really as cute as a button. Hey, take a listen. Prince is the only one that can can do what he did. You know what I'm saying? He did it and it was fly. What are you looking forward to seeing in this film? Prince. Anything more specific than that? Prince. Yeah, I think girls thought he was pretty sexy. Definitely sexy. He was a sexy, short little black man. He was kind of a sensitive jerk in a way, you know? And girls like that. How can you just leave me standing? his look. He just exuded sexuality, even though he probably only would come up to my navel, which isn't such a bad thing, if you think about it. Um, gosh, that might have worked out great. Even a guy my size can get something. So I was very excited, and I was rooting for Prince. I don't care where we go. I don't care what we do. He was knocking back some of the hottest women of the day. And at that time, I think he was dating Kim Bassinger, or before that, Apollonia, I guess, during, during the movie. The true gift to me was his knowledge that he gave me. People wanted us to be married and, and have little babies and, you know, live in this purple world, you know, but no, it wasn't that. Tragic but true. Totally. I can't believe this. They f forgot my birthday. 16 Candles, like I'm 30, and everybody around that age, you know, the John Hughes movies are a huge part of who they are. You saw like 16 Candles, you went like, this is my high school they're talking about. I, I know that guy, and, and I know all these guys. I love the best. Molly Ringwald was every girl's hero. She was a girl next door that was approachable and lovable and kind of shy. I loved the scene when her grandparents come and they're, you know, they're checking out how much she's grown. I just think that's hilarious. She's gotten her boobies. Oh, <laughs> I'd better go get my magnifying glass. <laughs> and they are so perky. I identified with them. And I was a late developer. I didn't need a bra when all my girlfriends needed one. It took forever. Here's this girl who needs a little privacy. She wants to date cute guys, and the only guy who's after her is this total dork. All right. I need to come around. I mean, Anthony Michael Hall is the eternal 80s icon of cinema, period. could relate to Anthony Michael Hall, but I also related to Long Duck Dong because I oftentimes was misunderstood, and he literally was misunderstood. What's happening, hot stuff? A lot of the dialogue, you couldn't get away with that today. Oh, no more Yankee, my wanky. It would be too politically incorrect to do a lot of these things, so at the time there was real innocence involved. Oh, sexy girlfriend! I was so obsessed with Jake Ryan. I thought he was like the hottest guy on the planet. I think I still have dreams about Jake Ryan, actually. 
Jake was just the ah oh, the coolest. And at the end, when they're sitting there with the cake between them, it was just so dreamy. I love eighty-four. Who is this girl, Cindy Lauper, and why is she so unusual? My first reaction when I first saw Cindy Lauper is, whoa, look at this woman. I just remember just with the red hair and her being so small, she just, she was like a rainbow. She wasn't just about an act or a look. She had a vocal range that was just stunning. Just wanna, just wanna, just wanna. I think anyone with a father like Cindy Lauper in that video should probably get out of the house as much as possible and have as much fun as possible. Was that really her dad? They used to say it was her dad. Yeah, people thought he was really her father. These people are stupid. I remember when she got into the whole WWF thing, which some people may have thought was detrimental to her career. I don't know, but all I can tell you is, you know, you don't see Bono hanging out with Captain Lou Albano. It was really cool when she came out with this song about, you know, masturbation. And everyone was like, oh. She Bop was about masturbation. I never knew that. Keep talking. <laughs> very cheeky and that allowed girls to be you know not so prissy they could be naughty and irreverent it got the chicks going and that's always important I get, get, get. News break. jackson was rushed to the hospital last night after a bizarre accident set his hair on fire while he was filming a television commercial when michael jackson's hair caught fire i was nowhere near the scene I'm just saying that for the record I'm not uh, uh i don't drink pepsi and i wasn't there the scene was wild as hundreds of fans tried to see Michael Jackson as he was carried into a Los Angeles area hospital with second and third degree burns on his scalp. You put all that curl activator in your hair, you gotta stay away from light bulbs, man. You know that. They taught us all a valuable lesson about how dangerous it is to mix, you know, hair products in open flames. Anytime your head explodes, I mean, it's, it's a, that's a tricky situation. It seemed like he didn't know what was happening, like something was in his hair and he started shaking it and it was all blue and white. Was it like the first form of plastic surgery or a good excuse, like if I burn myself, then they'll have to fix it? Girls started crying and all the lights went off immediately. We thought it was part of the act that was going on. That was a big scandal for a while. That's when people really cared uh, whether his hair caught on fire. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Hello. Hello. Is it me you're looking for? If so, press one. What we see happening in the Lionel Richie hello video is illegal in most states. This poor blind girl is completely being exploited by this man with horrible hair and oversized jacket. I long to see the sunlight in your hair. She was a student in Lionel's sculpting class and she was blind, but like love made her see what Lionel looked like. That's, that's another part that stands out in the video where she was like, Tell me what you think of it. Did I think the bus looked like me? Absolutely not. And I remember going to the director and said, Bob, hey, we, could, we could fix the hair a little bit and we could get the... And Bob looked at me and said, Lionel, she's blind. <laughs> Hello. Is it me you're I'm on CD4. Coming up, bow your heads. You're in the presence of comedy greatness. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, Spinal Tap is one of the most brilliant films I've ever seen. You put it up to a line. Eleven, exactly. Next on I Love 1984. But first, Mr. and Ms. 1984. Hello? It's the Dice Man with the moment you've all been waiting for. Time to name Mr. and Ms. 1984. I can barely contain my excitement. He was a guy, but he dressed like a chick and sang like one too. So guess what? Boy George is Mr. and Ms. 1984. There you go. Two genders for the price of one. Now get out of here. Mr. and Mrs. 84. I love you. I'm Soleil Moonfire. Here's a look at some of 1984's very special births. Mandy Moore, Freddy Krueger, Kelly Osborne, Hair Moose, and of course, my show, Punky Brewster. There it is, the miracle of life, 80s style. Born in 84. 
Big bottom, big bottom, talk about bun cakes, my girl's got them. Spinal Tap is one of the most brilliant films I've ever seen. End of story. I heard that Spinal Tap was mocking uh, Iron Maiden. They say it's like the Black Sabbath story. How much more black could this be? And the answer is none. None is that good? more none. black. Oh, just everyone, a quiet riot. And in the re first review of Spinal Tap, our name was mentioned in the review. Remember that? Yeah. I didn't like that either. Take a little bit of the cheekiness out of it, and, and it was it was so real. I mean, barring stuff like getting stuck in the pod and having an aluminum-covered cucumber down your pants, it's like, man, this is so real, you know? The amp's going to 11. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. It bothered me because it hits it so close to home. The review you had on Shark Sandwich, which was merely a two-word review, just said <laughs> sandwich. Um, Why did they print that? that? Why did they yeah, print that's that? That's not real, is it? You can't print that. Our second record was called Condition Critical, and we had a review that was just simply this. Condition Terminal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Rock and roll! I started thinking, hey, you know, this, uh, they were following us around. <laughs> Getting lost going to the stage. I think my all time favorite scene in Spinal Tap is the Stonehenge moment. The little children of Stonehenge. And they're waiting for this huge Stonehenge piece to come down from, from above and it ends up being, what, six inches big and it should have been 60 feet or something. You know when a tour's going bad when you're out on it and you start having these flashes in your head of spinal tap. I think that the problem may have been that there was a Stonehenge monument on the stage that was in danger of being crushed by a dwarf. There were too many small things going on there that really do happen that just a writer wouldn't know about. I think every band has a Spinal Tap DVD in their tour bus collection. <laughs> Spinal Tap, I think it's the greatest thing ever. I love 84. Hey, you must that sound. Everybody look what's going down. Ah, yes, ain't never fresh. Everybody wants to get down like that. Sounds good. Looks good. Feels good too. Oh, that's right.